All right, so now for the, uh, for the tutorial itself, uh, I'm going to ask uh, that you follow along with, with this because there are going to be some, some questions in the middle um, and I really want to encourage interactivity on this. So from the, um, from the Indico site, there's a link to the notebooks uh, on GitHub that I'll be, uh, I'll be using for this. Uh, that looks like this, this GitHub site. And there, there's a, a giant button launch binder. Please everyone do this. Please everyone click the launch binder button so that you'll have a copy of this going. Uh, and you'll be able to evaluate this along with me uh, and also uh, um, try different things and uh, ask me about those different things. Uh, the way that I view these tutorials is uh, I'm like <clears throat> I'm like a tour guide, you know, giving you a tour of, of some you know ancient ruins or something. Uh, and uh, I have a set itinerary uh, just to get us started. Uh, but um, any questions that you have along the way about what's this, what's that, uh, what happens if I do this, you know, what happens if I do that, uh, is more important than the planned and planned itinerary. Uh, this is here to, you know, give you a chance to, to ask about these things. So uh, please do launch that binder uh, so that you can be running this um, uh, without having to install it on your computer because everybody's computer is different and we, we can't deal with the installation issues in, you know, only one hour tutorial. Okay. Uh, or if you have it running on your computer anyway, go for it. <laughs> Jim, a quick question. Yeah. Given the way you're going to run the, the show here, uh, shall, shall we give only five minutes at the end and you, and you take, say, 55 minutes overall for the whole thing? Is that a good compromise? Well, toward the end, um, I made sure to include a little bit more material than we can cover. Mm -hmm. uh, so toward the end, it's going to be a little bit uh, of a soft ending. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I hope that there will be questions throughout. Uh, and then I'll go until I run out of time. Okay. Then, then I don't, I don't, uh, I don't bother you uh, uh, until one minute before. <laughs> All right. Sure. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah. So launch that binder button, and you should get uh, something that looks like this. And I'll just get going. All right. So for the upward and awkward array tutorial, I'd like to start actually. Uh, with not upward or awkward array, I'd like to start with uh, showing uh, uh, the same analysis several different ways, three root ways and one uh, upward, awkward array way. And actually, the point of this is, is not uh, um, uh, compare and contrast like good and bad, but compare and contrast like what do you get from this and what do you get from that? Um, because things are always best when used together. But mainly to show, you know, why, why are we doing this? What, what is different about it? So let's start with, okay, we're gonna make a Z-peak. Uh, it's like the, uh, the hello world of high energy physics. Um, so in root, uh, first we import a bunch of libraries, uh, we open the file, and then the pi root way of going about it, which is not the root way, I should say, but the pi root for loop way of going about it is the, the, the sort of most straightforward way to do it is to, um, you know, write a for loop over the events, cut out the events you're not interested in, and then for the events that you are interested in, compute and fill a histogram that was defined outside of the loop. Okay, so that finished after 24 seconds, and we got ourselves a Z peak and some low energy stuff, dead new ones. Um, okay, that was straightforward, uh, but um, uh, for this particular problem, uh, it didn't have to take 24 seconds. Uh, it could run a lot faster than that, and really, this is because you know we're doing Python stuff uh, in you know on the scale of the number of events, and the number of events is a very large. Here, it's uh, 123,000. So. Uh, the traditional way to solve that is to mix in some C++ because C++ is much faster than Python uh, when writing for loops. Um, uh, so 
Here is the same analysis in C++. Now you notice it's all red, and that's because this is all inside of a string. Uh, and this is being passed to uh, root G interpreter declare. So uh, we can declare a function, uh, all C++ syntax. In fact, this is like old fashioned C++. I'll be getting to our data frame in a moment. Um, and root, and actually this is PyRoot, but it's been use, using PyRoot in a very different way. Um, uh, having defined that function, we can now call it from Python. This compute is now defined on root. So we can say root.compute and we can run that thing and it is way faster than 24 seconds. Um, uh, you can run it a bunch of, uh, a bunch of times and, uh, and caching has an effect but um, uh, produces the same plot um, some 500 times faster, 700 times faster, something like that. Um, OK. Uh, and that's, that's a big enough factor to matter. You know, if it was like 20% faster, then, well, do what's convenient. But, uh, but if it's 500 times faster, that's the difference between a coffee break and a overnight. So now that is old fashioned C++. The, the new way to do this is using our data frame, uh, which uh, allows you to leverage Python quite a bit more for the organization of the analysis. So the modern way to do it is to build uh, workflows uh, that are like pipelines. So there's the our data frame has a, has a source DF, and then you make these little nodes uh, by assignment. So, uh, so DF2 mu, is when you take df and apply a filter to it. dfos is when you take df2 mu and apply a filter to it. So you make this chain of things, and the chain doesn't have to be a linear chain. It can split. Um, and everything that has to be fast that you know runs over many events uh, are inside these quoted strings, and these quoted strings are C++. So you're writing C++ to do things fast, but uh, you can organize your, your analysis, build the, the, the workflow chain in Python. So you get to use the, the bookkeeping of Python with the speed of C++, and that's very nice. Uh, when you do this, and here I decided to use the uh, as NumPy as the action that drives the, the calculation, because this all was just setting up the, the workflow. Now we run this, get an array, and uh, it's it's still quite a bit faster than, than PyRoot. Uh, there is some kind of caching going on so that it's, uh, uh, it's faster if you run it again. Um, and again, you know, we get orders of magnitude to make the same plots. Um, okay. So that was three ways to do it in, in Root. Now, uh, a workflow uh, that's natural to upward and awkward array is um, for you to not write any C++. That's the idea, is that you, you do everything in Python. You're not writing for loops in Python. Uh, all of the loops are happening in compiled code, but you don't write that code. You're, you're piecing it together from smaller parts. So um, here we'll import some stuff, load the events, and I'm going to just show this, uh, this T tree. Uh, this is sort of like a first look. It's kind of um, a text-based T browser, I suppose, um, to find out what are all the types of branches in this, what are the kinds of things that we can we can plot. Uh, the 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 way that we do things um, uh, is quite different from our data frame. We first extract arrays as one step. The first step is just get the arrays out, uh, and now this muons is an array. Uh, and it's a structured array that has things like fields inside of it. Um, and then when we're going, when we want to do any kind of analysis, uh, that means making new arrays from this array. So a cut, for instance, is an array. It's an array of booleans uh, that we construct by performing computations on this muon. So we take muon's charge. Uh, we ask how many of them there are. Uh, we require them to be at least two. Um, we require the sum of those uh, charges to be equal to zero, uh, adding over the two. Uh, that's the cut we want to apply. 
And then applying cuts is slicing. And we can, at the same time as sli uh, cut slicing, we can also be slicing to take up the first element or the second element and break them into two different arrays. So now mu1 is all the firsts, mu2 is all the seconds. Uh, uh, we can use Pythonic histogramming. This hist library is great. Uh, this just created an empty histogram. And this filled the histogram with this formula. I'm computing with NumPy. Uh, and this uh, uh, Jupyter view, this, on, this, this little thing only comes up uh, in Jupyter, and it's kind of a quick and dirty plot. If you want real plotting, um, uh, it has backends to Matplotlib, and could presumably have backends to other uh, favorite plotting packages. So, okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, now uh, pulling all that stuff together into a single slide, I'm oh, sorry, into a single cell. Uh, this is again on the order of. Uh, um, it's orders of magnitude faster than the than the pi root for loop. So now we have the the the, the cake and eating it too. We're doing everything in Python, uh, uh, but we're not hampered by the speed of Python, and we're using the same kinds of techniques that NumPy and Pandas users use. So okay, um, as a reminder, everybody's got uh, access to Slido. So if you have any questions, uh, just put them there. Really, anything that uh, that you ask there, I'll you know we'll all see it. You can be anonymous, uh, and uh, and I'll ask your questions as we go along. That anyway was was sort of the intro part. So I'm mentioning the the question box now because I'm moving on to uh, uh, to focus on uproot in in particular. All right. So. Um, now, so some more sort of grand view uh, um, um, of all this is that Uproot is not a framework. It only does root I/O, uh, and uh, we really wanted to avoid scope creep in Uproot. So anything that smacks of, you know, making histograms or uh, performing uh, computations, we wanted to make sure that that was not part of Uproot, um, because we didn't want, you know, there to be like, yeah, yeah. Uh, we didn't want uh, um, uh, Uproot to become, you know, a new like monolith. Um, so Uproot only does the root I/O. Awkward Array only handles array manipulation. So Awkward Array doesn't know anything about root, for instance. Uh, Hist only does histograms, etc. So it's all sort of a part of this complete breakfast. The idea is that all of these little packages each fit a different niche and they each do their own things. Um, uh, the, uh, um, in case you're, you're not aware, Uproot is not a thing that is calling root in order to do things. It is a separate implementation, and that makes it pip installable. So you can say pip install Uproot, uh, whereas it would be difficult to include the, uh, uh, the C++ code base in pip, uh, the C++ code base of root in pip, uh, although it is quite possible to include it in, in, in Conda. And so if you use so a little advertisement uh, for all the good work that uh, Chris uh, uh, and others have been doing on uh, uh, Conda Forge. Um, you can Conda install root, and that's a big deal because it'll be linked to your Python, and that's great. But anyway, Uproot is a uh, small separate package, and it uses all these other Python packages in order to do all the other things, like make histograms and uh, manipulate arrays and such. And it uses standard Python components whenever possible. Uh, here's the documentation. Um, it, so all these functions are, are documented. And now let's get into actually exploring a root file. So um, some terminology before we get into it. Uh, root file contains in it directories, and you can navigate around uh, in the different directories, kind of like you can in a file system. In fact, there's, there's a sense in which a root file is a little tiny file system and it has to deal with uh, the, the things that file systems have to deal with, like fragmentation and such. Um, the objects, anything that inherits from, inherits from T object, uh, can, be, uh, can be placed in directories as standalone objects. 
Um, but mostly we're using tea trees. And tea tree is one particular kind of standalone object that has a lot of substructure. Uh, tea tree has these tea branches, uh, and these are the named columns that you're usually interested in. You know, I want the PT, the eta, and the five, but I don't care about the other stuff. Um, and uh, these tea branches are broken into a number of tea baskets, and that's a detail that you might or might not get into. Uh, tea baskets are just um, uh, chunks of the data, like the first 50 events, the second 50 events, the third 50 events. Uh, and uh, the reason, the only reason that you're likely to get into tea baskets is if your tea baskets are too small and they are uh, ruining your read performance. So that's the name of that in case you need to get into that. Here we'll be living on the surface and just talking about tea trees and tea branches. Uh, so actually, before we even get into tea trees, let's, let's just look at some standalone objects. So here's a file with a bunch of histograms in it. Um, when you open something in, uh, in Uproot, be aware that you are getting the directory object. So go back to this diagram. You're getting this, not this. There's, there's one T file for the whole like, file, but then you can have lots of nested T directories. And so you're given the T directory because that is what you need in order to find you know, more stuff inside the T directory. Directories inside directories. Okay. Uh, directories inside directories, um, but the T file has some just sort of global file information um, that you want to get into if, if you are uh, interested in the compression of the file or something such like that. Now, these T directories, they act kind of like Python dictionaries. So here you see I, I pulled out a nested directory. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, by by using direct by using dict like syntax, and there are keys, values, uh, items, and a new one class names for for looking at all of them. Is there any limit in the size of data that uh, that upper can handle? Uh, none other than the uh, memory you have available on the machine. So um, no in principle limit, but uh, if Python runs out of memory, Python runs out of memory. So the, uh, uh, unlike a normal dictionary, these keys, values, items, and class names uh, have uh, extra um, arguments they can use to refine your search. Um, And you can use that to, to like get a bunch of histograms that match a naming convention, for instance. When I tried uproot on large data sets, I was not able to make it work nicely. The small, it's fine. Best practices. Okay, so the best practices uh, for, have, for problems with um, memory is to try to avoid reading too much. So, so for instance, in this keys, values, items, and class names, the values and items will read data out of the file. Because here you have uh, um, so history um, that keys only needs to find the names of all of the uh, the objects in there, so it's not doing too much reading. Um, but if I ask for items, that has just read every single histogram in the entire file, and all of that reading could be could be a problem. Um, more likely, running out of memory. Um, uh, could be when we're doing the analogous thing with a tea tree, if we're going to just read all branches in the tea tree just by default by saying tea tree dot arrays, it'll try to read everything and you might not have memory for that. Does uproot not include any of root? Uh, it's just an interface. That is, that is correct. Uproot does not include any root. Um, this, uh, this diagram uh, says it all. This is what everything is built on. So uproot is an independent implementation. Uh, so it just uh, reads the root files directly, you know, as, as files on disk. Okay. Right, so there's a lot of histograms here. Um, so uh, 
most of the histograms and graphs can be converted into uh, types of other Python libraries. And this is a, a point where uh, we actually just want to expand this. Uh, so we have some links and we'd like to make more links in the future. And, uh, uh, and this is a good place actually to get involved because uh, because writing these functions is not too onerous if you actually, if you know the libraries involved. So for instance, I pull out this histogram and this is a th1d. We have things like to numpy that will give uh, like what this would be if it had come from numpy.histogram or to hist to give you one of these hist objects. Um, and since that's got this uh, in Jupyter mini display, um, uh, that's a good way for browsing around uh, all of these, these histograms. So um, using the things that I was just talking about, the, uh, the fact that the keys, values, items, and class names, they have these filter by name, filter by class name intent uh, arguments. Uh, and you can click on these links to get to the documentation to get uh, more information about how to do, oops how to do this with that. Uh, three minute exercise starting now. In your binder from here, from this point, put some extra stuff uh, in order to pull out the one and only two dimensional histogram and plot it. Um, let me say plot it with uh, matplotlib. And that's three minutes. It's 9.52, so for me, uh, so 9.55. I'll just hang around while you um, uh, work on this exercise. And uh, let me, uh, I will clear this. Any other questions while doing the exercise are fair game? Um, meanwhile, I'll set up a poll. Okay. I'll get those questions in. There. So this is the poll. You know, I'll go to these questions. Uh, what about this issue? Well, okay. <laughs> it's an active issue. Let's take a look at that in a moment. And I'll answer the other one in the meantime. Is Uproot implemented in pure Python or does it, Uproot is implemented in pure Python. Um, and of course, in the same sense as PyHF, where, um, um, we, of course, use libraries that have uh, uh, compiled parts, most especially NumPy, uh, but also Awkward Array. Uh, none of these are actually Cython. Fields of struct interpreted with a type. So this is the issue. Fields of struct interpreted with a type of siblings. Uh, OK. Oh, if it's member-wise splitting, then that's that's a not yet handled part of root. And I'll get to, actually, I've got a Venn diagram a little bit further on, on uh, what can we read and what can't we read. Um, and actually, there are, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion on this issue. Um, and if you ever come across member-wise splitting, Actually, not just issues, but also pull requests. Member-wise splitting is uh, is a frontier part of Uproot. Um, being able to read uh, data that's up from a root perspective, it's an internal detail. You don't see the difference. Um, uh, 
but it's uh, serialized in a different way. And so it needs specialized code in order to deal with it. Uh, and we have <clears throat> several efforts actually ongoing to, uh, uh, to try to deal with number-wise splitting. Um, although if, if the question is, uh, 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 why has this issue not been like resolved yet? And it was from February. Uh, actually, the uh, 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 my main priority is uh, uh, adding the ability to write files in Upward Four is long overdue, uh, so that'll go before memberwise splitting. Okay. And oh, we're time. We're time. Okay, so the polls. Um, all right, so uh, only five people have been trying this. Uh, really, uh, all of you are not um, uh, following on Binder and trying things out and either successful or not successful. Okay. Okay. So I see that when I ask the question, I get a lot more no's, which is just saying that, um, yeah, so I guess you were uh, shy about saying that, uh, that it didn't work. Okay. All right, so uh, what I'll do here is I'll, I'll show sort of a, a walkthrough of how that, how that works. So here we're looking for the two-dimensional histogram. Um, let's start by, and since for the histogram to be one-dimensional or two-dimensional, that's a class name thing. So uh, um, one of the early things you probably want to do when you're just opening up a, a file that you're unfamiliar with is to look at the class names. This doesn't read any objects. This uh, gets all the names of things that you can open and their classes. So some things are T directories, some things are TH1D, TH1D, TH1D. There's a lot of these TH1Ds. This actually came from the uh, the run one Higgs to four leptons analysis. Um, so these are actually real plots used for physics. Um, and uh, one thing that you could do is just scan this by eye and look for the TH2D, which I might not might be able to do, might not be able to do because there's a lot of TH1Ds in here, and I didn't see it off off the bat. Um, but here I'm going to be using some root knowledge. Uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, two-dimensional histograms are TH2D or actually TH2 whatever. So one thing that I could do is uh, search through all of these. Um, how about uh, key value for key value in if value is TH2D. I could search for that. That returns a dictionary items. Could search for it that way. And so if it's exactly TH2D, could eventually find it by writing this big long list comprehension. But this is the sort of thing that uh, um, um, filter class name does. Or if you're not so sure that it's TH2D and you might and you think it might be TH2 something else, like TH2 app or TH2, whatever, you can use globs and such. So this is sort of an introduction to like, this is how you search around. Okay, and then having found something like this, now we can use values instead of class names and that is the histogram object. Sorry about the siren in the background. It's Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, so, uh, so that pulls out the one and only TH2D. There's its histogram, and then to plot it in matplotlib, the hist uh, function for that is plot. Okay. 
So uh, I'm going to switch this back to the Q&A. That was unnecessarily difficult. Read only directory should show have a rich show method with highlighting the trees and more. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and uh, so this is a good uh, point for um, if you want uh, higher level conveniences on this, um, it'd be great if uh, if you contributed them. Uh, that's actually a good candidate for the sort of thing where uh, community feedback would be great. Um, because as you can see from the um, uh, was it the member wise issue, uh, the uh, uh, there's a lot of effort going into just getting any root data out at all. Uh, so if you're if you'd like high level conveniences, uh, I, I would really uh, like to encourage the community to add these sorts of things. Uh, is there a grand collaboration such as CERN? One could just use Upper to perform the entire analysis. Um, there's, uh, in principle, yeah, you, you can do analyses with upward and, uh, and quite a few analyses are being done with uh, just upward. I'm not sure what the uh, grand collaboration about CERN is about, but. Um, so with that, with the, um, yeah, you can do whole analyses. Now let's get to some limitations. Like, can uproot read my data? And this is where we were just talking about uh, with a member wise. Uh, we should be aware that uh, the set of all objects in all root files is very broad. Over the last few decades, um, you know, a lot of root files have been made in a lot of very different kinds of ways. Uh, and uh, the, the root code is uh, necessarily complex in order to be able to handle all those different cases, of which there are many. Uh, so, and even then, uh, of all the things that have been put in files whose extension is .rot, uh, not everything can be read by root itself, uh, and I guess those are by definition uh, uh, invalid root files, by definition. But then what uproot can read is some subset of that, and it's a growing subset. We try to add more capabilities as time goes on, uh, but you know it's a subset. Uh, and then this thing where the histograms had special behaviors for knowing how to turn itself into a hist uh, or knowing how to turn itself into NumPy, this is even a subset of what uproot can read. Okay, so question, uproot could read the somewhat new rich protocol Oh, again, this is Henry's answer to the previous question about uh, uh, pretty printing stuff. That would be super cool. That would be super cool, by the way. Yes. Uh, but it's something that uh, we would like to see contributed because actually it doesn't, you wouldn't go deep into Uproot's internals. It is the sort of thing that uh, uh, a motivated user could do with some Python knowledge and some knowledge of Rich, in fact. Um, so here are some analysis specific classes. I'm, uh, hist was in this magenta. I'm going to talk about something in the orange now. Things that upper can read, but doesn't, but upper doesn't recognize. So uh, this uh, file actually came up because of a bug, bug report a long time ago. Uh, was from Ice Cube doing uh, analysis of supernova, and um, the uh, class names. Actually, instead of looking at the keys, let's look at the class names. The class names are, are user-defined classes. These are classes that were defined by IceCube, someone in IceCube, uh, to do this analysis. Um, and so we can recognize that it has that class. We don't know much, of, much about the class, but root includes the information about how to deserialize it. Uh, so this class contains all of these things that are based on the, the more simple types, integers and pointers and such. Um, so that means because we have this information is supplied in the root file, this, uh, this ice cube data that we've never heard of, uh, we're able to read it and look at its data members, um, including like standard maps and stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, this is how you could do a data analysis even with some custom classes um, assuming they're not like number wise split or something like that. So generally when you want to find out if Upper can, can handle something, it's just first, first go and try it. Uh, and if it can't, raise an issue and uh, we'll try to handle it. Okay, 
So uh, that was uh, all the um, navigating around through the uproot, um, other than tea trees, but tea trees are kind of what you're here for. Tea trees are the, the, the main thing that we put into root files. So now let's look into navigating tea trees. So here's a file that contains uh, just one tea tree. And um, when you enter into this, uh, there is a show method. And maybe, maybe actually this is what uh, you're looking for for the file. Uh, uh, in addition to just the, the file.keys uh, and values and, and items uh, to have something like show to you know, pretty print it. In fact, maybe, maybe this, this would be nice and rich as well. Um, so this is what you get by just showing. And uh, from, uh, from a lot of feedback, I know that, that uh, people use the show quite a bit. Um, but uh, when there is a convenient method like this, uh, uh, sometimes people can uh, not find out about the fact that there are more low level methods to get the data directly. Like they'll want to have the names of the branches but if you only know show, then we start parsing this and, 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 it, gets, and it gets pretty bad. I, I want you to know that, that you can use keys, type names, and items to get at all the data that's up there uh, in a more programmatic way. So you can integrate this into your scripts. Some time ago, I was going to use Pyroach to do customization of the root file made by experts. My land limited to standard root formats. Uh, you mean, I think you might have meant uh, unable to use uproot due to some customization of the root file. Uh, and um, uh, there are customizations of root files that will prevent uproot from being able to read it, uh, custom streamers. Uh, you are not limited to standard root formats like nano AOD. Um, uh, because this set of things that Uproot can read is not limited to you know, standards like nano AOD. Uh, but what falls into this and what falls out of this uh, can be very subtle. Uh, so if, uh, if experts add something that knocks it out of this group, then um, that's something we want to know about. OK. Uh, so then, in order to do any kind of uh, analysis with the tea tree data, uh, we want to get the data out as arrays. And the simplest way to do that is to uh, get a tea branch object and ask for its array. That is the most basic uh, array access. Um, some important parameters that I'll let you explore on your own by going to the documentation. Entry start and stop determines how much you read. Uh, and you can also set the library. Uh, so here we limit reading to five. And this is actually limiting the reading. So if you have a data that's too large and you can't read it into memory, try using entry start and stop so that you're not reading as much. Um, we can get a NumPy array instead of an awkward array by saying the library is NumPy or pandas series by saying that the library is pandas. And these are just abbreviations you can use the full name. Now, the single array uh, is, uh, is the basic interface, uh, but you're also able to read many arrays at once, uh, which again, if you're not careful with that, you can run out of memory. Um, but you can read many arrays at once, and that's useful if you want to minimize the number of round trips with like a remote. Uh, you've got all your data in X or D, and uh, every time Uproot asks for something, there's a round trip latency involved in that. So if you want to uh, get all of the arrays with a single request, uh, um, use the ttree.arrays method. Uh, and what that will return is some kind of a group. The group depends on the library. So uh, if library is NumPy, then arrays returns a dict dictionary of, uh, from the name of the branch to the array. And these are all NumPy arrays. Um, 
If the library is pandas, a group is a data frame. So if you are looking for the pandas way, the pandas way is uh, tea tree arrays libraries pandas. I'll also know you can uh, you can set the uh, library. Uh, you can uh, set the library uh, uh, globally, so you don't have to keep saying that. So default library equals PD or something. Um, the first argument can be used to extract T branches by name. Um, all right, so question, is there an analog of T tree index uh, for adding a friend tree? Um, actually, the, the, the friend tree information with the T tree index uh, is, uh, is part of the frontier. It's, it's data that we can see it there and we've been skipping over it. Uh, if there's enough uh, interest in doing T tree indexes, uh, we can extract that information. I know where it is. Um, and actually, you know, that would be a good thing to put in the pandas index because then you can do a pandas data frame join for two friend trees. And that would be a really good way to use pandas to do friend trees. Oh, just random thought. Okay. Why would we pick pandas over numpy over awkward for review your data? What's the, okay. Um, uh, numpy for speed if your data are simple. And we'll be talking about when you need awkward array for the, for the complexity. Uh, but other than uh, speed versus complex data types, uh, that's the choice between NumPy and awkward. Pandas is if you want to use all the pandas functionality. Pandas is slower than NumPy for sure. Uh, and uh, then awkward array in some situations haven't done like all the different cases. Uh, and there are also some things you, you can't express with, with pandas, but if you're going to do a pandas analysis and you have a lot of pandas functions you want to be using, then yeah, turn it into pandas. Uh, and actually, I'm going to be using pandas a lot in these examples because, um, uh, because it makes a pretty uh, table. And it's in, in Jupyter. So um, the thing that I'm using this pretty table in Jupyter to show is that um, what goes here in the first argument uh, although we could put the, the names of the branches that we wanted, uh, that worked because the name of, of branches are just simple expressions that when computed give the branches. What goes here actually are full expressions. Uh, so we can make a table with uh, uh, column titles like that. Um, this was to support aliases. Um, uh, aliases are usually burned into a T tree. Uh, but you can define aliases on the spot. And one of the nice things uh, that you might want to use that for is to give your uh, pandas columns meaningful names. So this is the aliases. Actually, I should maybe make this more explicit. Aliases. Uh, and these, are, these expressions will be used in evaluating this. Can we still use NumPy or pandas if we have jagged arrays? Not really, or sort of. Uh, and that's the... First thing that I'll get into about awkward array, and it might be the last thing I get into in this uh, tutorial. Um, so speeding on to, to that question, what is the expression engine for the aliases? Very, very good question. Uh, it's pluginable, and uh, the only plugin is Python. So these expressions are all being evaluated in Python. There's not any computational advantage to doing the uh, this calculation inside of these strings. Uh, although it did make a pretty slick way to get a, a pandas data frame in a one-liner. Um, uh, but the idea is that this Python engine, uh, we'd like it to be swappable with uh, um, an implementation of the T tree draw syntax in Python. And there's a package called formulate that does this, but it needs some dusting off. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's the kind of thing that we'd like to see there. We'd like to see this, these be uh, tea tree draw expressions. All right, I'm not gonna clear this because I wanna keep this question around. Uh, but before uh, leaving this, I wanna make this point um, that since these are expressions, you wanna be careful with uh, branch names that have slashes in them or any attempts to uh, 
get wildcard paths with star because slash is division and star is multiplication. Even if this were t true draw syntax, that would be a problem. So if you want to be selecting t branches by some sort of name filter, such as these glove patterns, um, use the filter name, filter type name, filter branch uh, on in the arrays uh, in order to get that. And um, if you have a naming convention on your arrays like nano AOD, uh, that can be super useful. And also note that these are exactly the same interfaces for you know, keys and type names. So um, you can debug your filter without reading data and then apply it to arrays and read the data. Is it possible to cut variables we're not reading? Uh, uh, it is possible to put a cut here, I should say. Uh, it's using the same uh, expression, well, same expressions that are not being shown here. Uh, px1 greater than zero, let's say. Bother. I need a comma. Yeah, so now the px1s are all positive. Although uh, this is really just using Python. This is doing the same thing as if you had extracted these arrays and applied that cut after the fact. Um, uh, th so to answer the question of, can you cut variables without reading them? Uh, no, um, not technically no, but logically no. Uh, you have to read the data in order to cut on it because you have to know the values of the quantities in order to cut them. So any kind of cut will involve a read. Um, putting the cut here in this sort of uh, convenient syntax uh, is um, uh, hiding the fact that it is in fact reading this, but it has to read it in order to know which px's are greater than zero in order to apply the cut. Um, getting arrays as manageable chunks with iterate and collections of files. I'm going to leave that on your own because I want to get to the jagged arrays because there's 10 minutes left. So this is um, uh, the next really important point that the reason I wanted to keep this question around. Okay, Ben, as I recently learned through digging source code that Pandas' query of valid engines support backtick escaping of containing bad characters. Uh, and maybe, okay, so maybe we want to start using uh, backticks in our Python uh, in order to do the same thing as, as Pandas. Um, so that, that would be cool. Uh, we actually, uh, um, those strings, those Python strings, uh, we evaluate their abstract syntax tree, the AST, before sending them on. So we would be able to do things like that. Although backticks, that might be a, a syntax change, but that's all doable. Can you use uproots to write a new branch to an existing t-tree from pandas data frame? Uh, that is why uh, uh, it's such a high priority to add uh, file writing to uproot, because currently uproot4 cannot write files. And that's exactly why we want to add that. OK, so now in my 10 minutes left, I'm going to talk about jagged arrays. Oops. Uh, and this is, is just moving. Uh, this just got uploaded. OK, I'm going to archive these in order to talk about jagged arrays. OK, so uh, I deliberately showed examples where the data were simple, where there was um, where uh, in the previous example, all of the uh, type names had been just like an integer or a float per event. Here, <clears throat> uh, uh, it's, it's quite common to get, oh, and such as this one, net PT, the, the missing energy in each event is just one number per event. So we can get a NumPy array of that, no problem, and we can slice it as a NumPy array, no problem. OK, but a lot of our data can't be expressed that way. There's a, we have a lot of data that's like this, muon pt, where we have a variable number of muons in every event. This first one had no muons. The second event had two muons. And so there's two pt values, and so on. If we were to look at just the first 20 events with this entry stop, and now taking that jagged array and say to list, turn it into Python lists, so we can really examine it, uh, but you know you want to limit to only like twenty events when you do that. 
we see that the data looks like this. There are some events because this is Higgs to four muons, uh, so Higgs to four leptons. Some of them have four muons in them. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, that's what these types are. Float arrays. In C++, this would be an array. Uh, in awkward, it's, uh, it's known as a jagged array. That's a CS term for uh, uh, arrays that can have variable number of, of components. So uh, it is possible to do that in NumPy. Uh, I want to show that um, the library is, equals NP is not broken. It is capable of putting all that stuff into a NumPy array, but this is an array of NumPy arrays. Uh, and that's because you can put Python objects in NumPy arrays. And I do not recommend this because uh, putting Python objects into a NumPy array turns that NumPy array into an inflexible list. Um, you don't get any of the performance advantages if it's a NumPy array of Python objects. And in addition to the lack of performance advantages, let's say that we wanted to say, uh, take all events from the first dimension, uh, you know, the first dimension is events, and take up to the first muon. So we want to see the zeroth, you know, the, the, the first muon in each event if it exists, and nothing if it doesn't exist. Uh, if it's a if it's an awkward array, you can express slices like that. You know, no problem. Okay, the first one had zero muons, so the inner slice took out nothing. The second one had one it had two muons, uh, so the inner slice took the first one. And some of these had four, uh, and they'll be just taking the first one. But when you try to do that in NumPy, it's an error because uh, these things in the NumPy array is not a second dimension of the array. It is random Python objects that, Py that NumPy doesn't know anything about. Random Python objects that happen to be NumPy arrays, but nevertheless, NumPy does not know anything about them. Uh, if you had such a thing, you would be forced to write a loop in Python, but that's not uh, recommended because it's non idiomatic and slow. And now, as of uh, NumPy 20, they start warning you about it. They say, if you're really going to do this, uh, uh, explicitly say D type is object. So, how come NumPy doesn't support jagged arrays? And could this uh, eventually be included? Um, actually, the, the scientific Python community um, hasn't really been. The, I, can, I can really count on one hand the number of projects that have attempted to deal with jagged arrays. Uh, they're hard to, hard to come by. Uh, and the first one is five years old and abandoned. Um, so uh, jaggedness is kind of a frontier thing. Um, in high energy physics, we deal with uh, variable length nested data all the time, but only recently have started using Python and, and NumPy and such. Python and NumPy have been dealing with uh, arrays for a long time, but only recently have started dealing with jagged arrays. So that's why it's not a NumPy, and NumPy is kind of too old of a library to uh, have that kind of a fundamental jump. Although, you know, if they integrated awkward array into NumPy, uh, I would be very happy. Is it better intuitive, uh, intuitively to understand, to extend attribute positional indexing a commutative and what? Uh, well, okay, so this question is kind of beyond the scope of what I've introduced so far. Um, uh, by attribute and positional indexing, we're talking about indexes that are strings versus, and, and therefore fields of a file name, and indexes that are integers, in other words, um, uh, like this integer. Um, and I haven't talked about enough yet in order to really uh, answer this question. So I'll qu answer the question in Slack offline. Can awkward arrays be converted into ragged tensors in, uh, in TensorFlow? I think that would be awesome, actually. Uh, I've been looking at tens TensorFlow's ragged tensors for a while. And, uh, and I think that that, and uh, two, tens uh, two underscore TF from underscore TF functions would be great. Uh, and if there's enough use cases for it, uh, that would promote its development. So how do operations on TensorFlow ragged tensors compare? Um, awkward array is much more general. Uh, tensor, uh, ragged tensors are only the jagged part. 
And the jagged part is being used here as motivation, but it's kind of the foot in the door to, um, we want full data types. Uh, and uh, jagged arrays or arrays of lists is only the, the beginning of full data types. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead to what do I mean by full data types? This is what I mean by full data types. So in general, awkward array data types T, any that the T, the type that any uh, array can have, can be numbers, booleans, date times, et cetera, variable length and fixed length lists of T. And so that includes lists of lists of lists of lists. Uh, records with named or unnamed, in other words, tuple fields of type T1, T2, and that's where this, this question was getting at. Um, missing values, T or none, uh, such as the examples that Henry was showing in Python uh, with uh, option type. And also heterogeneous types, um, although that's, that's kind of the bleeding edge that you can have a, a data that whose type is either T1 or T2 or T3 or whatever. Um, and so this data model is considerably more general than uh, ragged tensors, but it would be cool to have a uh, 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 converter function so you can get plain old jagged arrays right into TensorFlow. Uh, and before leaving this, I want to say that pandas can kind of do this too. And I have a sample here with pandas. And by the way, we just we just experienced some some pandas slowdown. Um, if you notice how much slower that that loaded. Um, so here we're taking all of the branches that start with muon. Uh, and since all of them have the same jagged structure, they all have the same number of uh, sub entries per entry, we're able to make an index for this table that reflects that, uh, that nestedness. And you can use this index with some pandas functions in order to do jagged array things in pandas. Now I'm gonna show some of the limitations of that. So let's say that we want to include in the same data frame, um, actually, some variables that are, uh, so the met PT and met phi, there's one per event, and the muon PT, muon eta, muon phi, there's several per event. That having the, the whole data frames index be based on this muon's jaggedness means that the non-jagged things have to be duplicated or removed. So any events with no muons, we don't see what the net is in order to get it in the same data frame. And then even more so if you want to include uh, generator level gen, oh yeah. Uh, generator level in that same, uh, since this has a variable number of objects per event, and this has a different variable number of objects per event, there's no way that those two can be in the same data frame unless you do some kind of squashing and, um, and you are allowed to uh, take these two data frames and squash them how you like. So uh, it's 1030. Uh, I can continue answering questions on, the, uh, on Slack, maybe just this last one. And quickly comment on the time scale getting awkward in RDF. Uh, this is an uh, awkward and our data frame uh, interoperability. So you can take an awkward array, send it into our, our data frame, take an R data frame, send it into an awkward array is a, is a project I very much want to do, but it has to sit after uproot file writing. Uh, at least uproot file writing has to happen first. Um, so we're talking about some, some months in the future. Okay, since I've answered these, I'm going to clear the board now for any last, last, last minute questions. No, 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 no last minute questions. We have to go to Slack uh, because uh, the next talk is up. Um, by the way, there's tons more material on uh, doing some simple and quite complex operations with awkward array involving a lot of uh, examples with number. So if you want to learn about number, um, this is a good place to do it offline in this.